I'm going to try to make it through this without losing my voice this morning. Some of you might like the idea of that. In honor of St. Patrick's Day yesterday, I wanted to give you some information on four-leaf clovers. Did you know that you should never iron a four-leaf clover? Because you don't want to press your luck. That was a good one. You know, I've got so many questions in life. And sometimes it feels like I can never find the answer to them. You know, you just want to ask why. For instance, there was a lady that went to a church that we were youth pastors at many years ago. She was pregnant with a child. They had, her and her husband had tried to have children for years. She went into her last OB appointment at 39 weeks, and her baby was healthy and fine. And the very next day, she quit feeling movement, and her child had passed away. And I think, why, God? Just this, this morning, I was scrolling through Facebook, and a lot of my family still lives in Nicholasville, and I saw the story of a 15-year-old girl who had gotten a car wreck last night. Four teenagers driving in an SUV, and they ran off the road, and a 15-year-old girl passed away. I just think, why? This week, a family friend of ours, he's 48 years old, been having some back problems, didn't really know what was going on, thought he had a bulging disc in his back, and he went in to find out that his body is ridden with cancer. He's got four children from the ages of five to 12, and I just think, why, God? Why? And some of you are like that in your life right now. We say, why all this pain? Why all this heartache? Why all this badness? And we've been studying the last words of Jesus. We've been studying this series called Famous Last Words. And today we're going to look at the story of Jesus as he's on the cross and he says, why? In Matthew 27, 45 through 46, it says this, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came all over the land. So this is in the middle of the day. In the middle of the day, when it should have been bright and sunny, but the Bible says darkness came over all the land. And I don't know why it happened. But I can tell you that we know that Jesus became sin, and when he became sin for us, his heavenly Father turned away. And when his father withdrew his presence from the world, the world became dark. In verse 46, some of the loneliest words in all the Bible, the Bible says this. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? May the words of Jesus minister to you this morning in a way that would touch your heart deeply as we think, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I read a story <clears throat> of an ER doctor. It said it was a true story, but we'll see. He said a guy came in after a car wreck and his neck was just completely burned up. And the doctor said, how in the world after a car wreck would your neck look like that? Excuse me. And the man said, well, my wife and I had just got one of those nice new invisible fences and leashes for our dog. And I wanted to see if it would work, so I put the collar on. And I told my wife, I said, well, let's see how far it'll work to know if we can actually use it. So he got in his car and he said, look, I'm going to drive over the hill. And when I get pretty far away, I'm going to blow the horn. When you hear the horn blow, then just shock me and we'll see if it works. So he got in his car and he drove over the hill where his wife couldn't see him anymore. And he blows the horn and she shocks him and it 
hurts him so deeply and intensely that he starts to swerve. And the person coming the other way did what any normal person would do, and they blow the horn. (laughs) Now his wife, thinking that it just must not have worked the first time, decides to shock him again. And he swerves back into traffic and surely the person continues to honk. And his wife just continues to zap him. Eventually he runs off the road and into the ditch and that's how he ended up in the yard. I don't really know why I told you that story, I just liked it. There are a lot of times in life that things happen that we don't have good reason for. (coughs) Excuse me. Why do good people die young? Why does God answer some prayers and not answer other prayers the way that we think he should? Why do some people desire in their life to get married and some people just think they should spend their whole life sharing about Christ? They pray at night and some people want to be married and they never can find the right person. Why do some people who get married and promise to love each other forever end up crushing each other? Why do some people whose greatest desire is to have kids not able to have them? And other couples can just look at each other and get pregnant. Don't think of me. Why do so many things just seem so unfair? One guy, he asked the question in a much more common kind of way. He said, why is my life so empty? Why do I wake up every day in the same old bed take the same old shower, eat the same old food, go to the same old job, do the same old work, come home, eat the same old dinner, answer the same old questions from the same old wife, and wake up and do it again the next day. Is there more to life than this? But Jesus on the cross, he cried out, my God, My God, why have you forsaken me? If you're in the middle of a challenging time right now, or maybe one day you will be, there will come a time when well-meaning Christians will come and they'll give you the answers to all your problems. They'll tell you exactly why everything bad is happening to you. And if you're taking notes, there's three more than common easy answers for these hard questions. The first one that some Christians will give you is it's all your fault. It's your fault that all of these bad things are happening to you. If you didn't have some sin in your life, there must be some secret thing that's going on that we don't know about that has caused this to happen. It's all your fault. Maybe you've never heard that. People have told that to me. And another thing that you might hear is this. Oh, it's all Satan's fault. Everything that's going on in your life, it's bad. It's all Satan's fault. And as everyone knows that we can blame pretty much anything on him. What some of you may not want to believe is there are evil forces in this world. There are some things that happen that we can't explain that I do believe are the enemy's fault. So some people will say, hey, it's your fault. It's Satan's fault. But if not, they'll say, you know what? It's God's will. What I find really irritating is there's some people that will come up to you and they'll say, you know what, it's all Satan's fault, which will immediately be followed by a person that say, you know what, this is God's will. So which one is it? Which one is it? And what's interesting is if we examine the words of Jesus on the cross and we look at his life as a whole, we'll know that from the moment he was born, that his spiritual enemy, Satan, attacked Jesus. And oftentimes he did it through people. Even when Jesus was a little baby, Herod sought to have him killed. Jesus in his hometown was known as a prophet without honor. 
There was one time that Jesus was on the edge of the cliff and some guys wanted to push him off. People called him a heretic. They called him a fanatic. They said that he was demon-possessed, that he was a drunk, that he was a glutton. They said that Jesus was always hanging out with the wrong kind of people. They said Jesus was not one of us. He's from the wrong side of the street. He was falsely accused. He was tortured, beaten, taken to the cross. And what is interesting to me is that when Jesus suffered at the hands of men, he never complained once. In fact, the first words that we can find in the four gospels of him uttering anything that even resembles a complaint was when he became sin for us. And he cried out, my God, my God. Why? You see, it's very easy to have faith when the sun is shining. But it's another story to have faith when the world becomes dark. How deep is your faith? And one of my favorite stories of deep faith is found in the Old Testament. There were three Hebrew children, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Well, that's not right unless you watch Veggie Tales. <clears throat> but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were standing one day before the evil king Nebuchadnezzar. See, he had made this idol. It was 90 feet tall and it was 90 feet wide, made out of pure gold. And he said, You're going to bow down and worship this. And they said, We worship God alone. And the king said, no, 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 no. If you're going to live, you will worship this idol. And the boy said, no, we won't. And the king said, well, if you don't do it, then I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace and burn you alive. It's easy to have faith when you're safe. It's easy to have faith when nothing bad is going to come against you. It's another story when you are in a real life situation when you see if your faith is real or not. How deep is your faith? When darkness enters your world, how real is your faith? These three Hebrew children, they uttered some of the greatest words of faith of all time. They said to the king, the king said, I'm going to destroy you. And they said, our God will deliver us. It's incredible faith. Then they took their faith to an even higher level and they said, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't do what we think he should, even if he doesn't come through the way we feel like he should, even if he doesn't do what we think he should, we will not bow down to this false God because we serve the one true God. How deep is your faith? Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And one of the greatest things that has gotten me through some of the deepest and most difficult times of my life is this idea I'm about to show you, and it really helps if we all play along. Are you ready? I'm going to show you a paper, and it's got two words written on it. Are you ready? So there's two words written on this piece of paper, right? There's two words on this piece of paper. I'll say that again. There's two words on this piece of paper. How many of you, when you look at this piece of paper, you see the words, no where? Raise your hand. No where? No where? Okay. How many of you, when you say, no, 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 that's not right. It says, now here. Right? Now here. And what this just goes to show us is that when we can look at one thing, we can see it totally differently. When we look at just one event, all of us can see it in a totally different manner, and that goes with the same thing in our lives. There are instances in our lives when we'll look at it, and there are things that are going bad, and you'll say, you know what? God is nowhere to be found. In the middle of my pain, in the middle of my grief, God is nowhere. And there will be people on the outside, and they'll say, no, you don't understand. In the middle of what you're going through right now, God is now here. The exact same event, we can see it in two totally different manners. We can see it in two totally different 
ways, from two totally different perspectives. That's why I love the way that Paul put it to us in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 12. Excuse me. He showed us that on this side of eternity, we only see part of the story. He said in verse 9, he said, For we know in part. For we know in part. And now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. He said, now on this side of eternity, we only see things partly the way we should. We only see half the story. (laughs) But on the other side of eternity, we'll see everything in full. In the middle of the darkest times of my life, I say, you know what? I'm only seeing part of the story. I'm only seeing half of what's going on here. God's perspective is so much higher than my own. God's perspective is so much greater. His ways are higher than our ways. His understanding is greater than mine. You see, we only see the story in part. You think about Jesus dying on the cross, and <clears throat> excuse me, you can only imagine the different perspectives. See, the crowd was looking at him that once one time had, had screamed out, crucify him, crucify him. And they're watching him hang on the cross and some of the crowd is thinking, yes, we're finally ridding the world of another heretic. And then you think of the disciples. And they're watching this man that they had spent three years with, walking, ministering. And he's hanging and he's dying and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what's happening? We've done everything that he asked. We followed him everywhere he wanted to go. How could this story end? Did we do all of this for nothing? And then you look at Jesus as part of the story, and although I don't fully understand why he asked why, I know that he did it to fulfill a prophecy from Psalm 22, 1 that says, he cried out, my God, my God, why? When you think of God's part of the story, where he's looking at his son, I can imagine only that his heart is breaking. And he turned away with the most sacrificing, selfless act of love you could ever imagine. And we can look for a moment at some insight that God gave us to his part of the story. And sometimes he gives us that. Sometimes we may not see until the other side of eternity, but in this case, we get to see part of it. So why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why? And I think we can see at least two reasons why. If you're taking notes, the first reason is this. The father forsook Jesus because he became sin. (coughs) Excuse me. So why did God forsake him? Because Jesus became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him what? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. We can never forget that God hates sin. And wherever God finds sin, sin must be judged. But Jesus became sin for us and died on the cross in our place. So why did God not look on? And it says this in Habakkuk 1.13. It says, God's eyes are too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate wrong. So in that moment, Jesus became sin. He became hatred. He became murder. He became adultery. He became jealousy. He became envy. He became lying. And when Jesus became this, God's eyes were too pure to look on to sin. 
He had to turn away. I love the way that Arthur Pink described his holiness, and I'll paraphrase. He said, so holy is God that mortal man cannot look upon him in his essential being and live. So holy is God that even the heavens are unclean in his sight. So holy is God that when Abraham beheld a glimpse of his glory, he said, I am but dust and ashes. And Job, when he saw a glimpse of the presence of God, said, therefore I despise myself in his presence. Isaiah, getting a glimpse of the presence of the glory of the Lord, as his train filled the temple, said, woe to me, I'm ruined. He said, I'm becoming undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. God is so holy and so full of love that from his perspective, when the world asked why, he said, I'll tell you why it was done for you. And the second thing is this, if you're taking notes. My God, my God, why? Number two, we see that the son was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. See, Jesus became sin and died with sin and was buried in a grave. And three days later, God raised him from the grave, clearly showing that he was greater than sin and death and that he had defeated everything. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says this, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, by his suffering, by his stripes, and another version says, we have been healed. My God, my God, why? And God would say, I did this out of love for you. <clears throat> if you're asking why, if you're hurting and you don't understand, please never forget the father's part of the story. There's a story of a dad who, the love of his life was his son and his wife he had an eight-year-old boy, and the dad loved his job. He operated a drawbridge, and he did it with integrity, and he had to raise the bridge and lower the bridge so that ships could come through, and then we would lower it so the train could go across. And one day, the son said, you know what, Dad, I want to come to work with you. And he was ecstatic. He said, okay, let's go. Let's go to work together. And the son went with him, and they spent the day together, and he had must have raised and lowered the bridge 13 or 14 times and came later in the day, and all of a sudden, the father couldn't find his son. And he knew he was about to have to raise the bridge again or lower the bridge again. And he starts screaming for his son, son, where are you? Son, where are you? And finally, the boy screams, daddy, I'm right here. And somehow the son had wandered down into the gear room. And he's looking up at his father, and the man knew in that moment that he was going to have to make a decision. He was either going to have to lower the bridge and take the life of his son, or keep the bridge up and allow hundreds of passengers on a train to plummet to their death. And he looks at his son, and his son is down there, and in a split second, the father made the most sacrificial decision a father could ever make, and he threw the switch. And as he throws the switch, the gears start to turn, and his son was quickly caught up. With panic and fear, he turns to his father, and he says, why? And the father couldn't bear to look, so he turned away. As he looks away, he sees the train coming across the, the drawbridge and the people on the passenger train are sitting and some of them are having meals and they're reading the newspaper completely oblivious to what's going on. The father in his darkest moment sees this. Can you imagine for just a moment what the father feels like when we live our lives without taking notice of the most sacrificial, loving gift that anyone could ever give. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the last verse in your notes would be the words of God saying, after what Jesus did for us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And some of you, in the middle of pain, if you'll stand with me, if the worship team would come, <clears throat> some of you in the middle of your pain would say, you know what? God is nowhere. And still others of you will draw close to him and you'll say, you know what? That's not the case at all. God is now here. Stand with me and let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Father, I thank you that even in the middle of our pain, you have never left us. You have never forsook us. Father, I pray that in the middle of our struggles, that you would help us to see your part in our story. Help us to hold on to you. Lord, this morning we just declare our love for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.